here we go on camera. Today's February 6, 2020. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the History Center. And with me is Sir Ver Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Alan Teasy. Mr. Teasy is a 21-year veteran of the United States Navy, and he's agreed to come in and talk to us about his life and his military service serving our country in the Navy. And this is part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and we really appreciate you coming in, Mr. Teasy. You're welcome. Could you give us your full name and when and where you were born? Alan Frederick Ernest, I go by initials F-E, Thies, T-H-I-E-S-E, -E, and we shorten that up and say T-Z. Okay. I was born on a small farm on top of a hill. We couldn't see the Mississippi River, but it was very close, a little town called Clayton, Iowa, in Clayton County, okay. northeast corner. Okay. And what city and state do you live in currently? Macon, Georgia. Okay. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I was the oldest of six children. My folks had three boys, three girls. Um, four of us were born during the beginning of World War II and the following years. And my youngest sister in that time frame was born in 44. I think my dad, who was a farmer, was going to be exempt from military service, but he wanted to make real sure, so they had four kids right away. <laughs> and then the other two siblings were born in 50 and 52. Okay. So there were six of us total, three boys, three girls, like I said. And we were all essentially raised on a small, general purpose, 80-acre farm near Garnethville, Iowa, which is not that far from Guttenberg which is also along the Mississippi River. In other words, I'm talking about a circle no more than six or eight miles from the Mississippi River. Yeah. Talk a minute about what it was like growing up in a small town and on a farm. Well, I've got to say first, <clears throat> we didn't know there was any better way to live. Television wasn't around in Northeast Iowa till I was a junior in high school. We thought we were doing real well. Mm. <clears throat> and my dad would always jokingly say he was raising his own higher hands for the farm. <laughs> the only thing you got to do for your kids is buy them new shoes before they go to school every fall. And this was in the late 40s, yeah. early 50s. And we all had our tasks to do. And I can remember as a six-year-old, my dad insisted I get up and help him do the morning chores. I was not of much value, but I think the regimen was established. Get up, get going, and you know, we had half a day's work done before we ate breakfast, and then walked up the hill to, honest to goodness, one room country school, which was on the corner of our parents' farm. Wow. Now, in spite of what everybody says, we walked uphill both ways, <laughs> to school and from school, it was a limestone rock building. Uh, when it closed, I think in 52, there was me, my siblings, and my classmate and his three siblings. There was a total of eight of us there, and the move was made to consolidate, so all these schools no longer exist. Okay. You know, some are still empty buildings. This one was sold at public auction, and people hauled the limestone rock away. Oh, yeah. But, you know, we had everything we could possibly think of. When my sister and I were old enough, I think maybe third or fourth grade, because she was one year behind me, we carried the drinking water to school in a bucket from our folks' farm. Wow. One, one teacher for whatever grades were. Very primitive by today's standards. Yeah. But. Did you ever have the opportunity to travel much when you were that age, say in grade school, early high school? Before you went into the military? The one trip I can remember is, I believe, 1949 or 1950. My folks had just bought a 1949 Packard four-door sedan, and we went to visit some of my mother's mother, 
relatives in South Dakota, not too far from Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the high point of my travel, our senior class trip was get on a train in Dubuque, Iowa, three or four in the morning, ride to Chicago, view the shed aquarium and the um, planetarium, have dinner somewhere, I can't remember where, and get on the train and ride back to Dubuque, a one-day senior class trip. Oh, there was only 26 of us, 13 yeah. boys and 13 girls. Yeah. And we were living high on the hog on that <laughs> trip, too. I mean, we thought we were something, because none of us had ever had an experience of yeah. a train ride. Wow. Well, it had to be quite a experience seeing the big city of Chicago Old after... Oh, heavens, yes. <laughs> and directionally challenged, because the train out of Dubuque came around and circled and came into Chicago from the south. So all day long, we're all confused, because <laughs> all farm kids knew how to reckon direction based on where the sun was. Oh, yeah. Didn't work in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start thinking about the military? As, as Well, I graduated from high school, went to uh, Valparaiso University, and my declared major was uh, education. And like all good little German boys in that time frame, the goal every mother was to have their firstborn kid get into the clergy. Well, she accepted the fact that I could probably be a good teacher, liberal arts, and my major was pizza and beer. So after a year and a half with a very inadequate grade point, they said, come home. So three semesters, I went home, worked casual labor, and I think at the time I was in the early 20s, the uh, draft, now this is before the Vietnam right. conflict was even talked about. Um, I was six months away from the draft, so I was serious at thinking, what am I going to do with my life? One day I decided to go see a recruiter, and the recruiter that was in at the county seat, mm -hmm. you know, it was like the old circuit riders. Mm -hmm from years ago that recruiters went around to the county seats. Well, the day I hit the county courthouse in Clayton County, the Navy recruiter was in. He gave me a pretest and said, hey, you did well enough, we can use you. And at the time I was doing casual labor for my uncle and he said, you know, we've got to check things out and get you set up an appointment and all this. I said, well, next week I will be on this farm off of US Highway 52 uh, if you're seriously thinking about letting me enlist, come meet me at the farm. And he came and met me that <laughs> following week, I forget what day of the week, and had bus tickets and said, go down tomorrow morning to the terminal, which was a gas station in Guttenberg, get on the bus and ride to Des Moines, check in through the YMCA and the rest of his history. I was sworn into the Navy, uh, I think 31 August, after going through all the exams. There were 80 of us people that we were all going to go in the Navy. At the end of the day, after we were sworn in, we went into this big theater at Fort something Des Moines, and somebody walked on the stage and said, how many people want to go to Great Lakes for training? None of us really knew where that training was. And one poor young man raised his hand. And this was, you know, end of August. We knew that Great Lakes was going to be cold. The rest of us said, mm. <laughs> he said, okay, the rest of you are going to San Diego. We were joining the Navy to get away from the farm and see the world, right? <laughs> and I, I was really hung up on being in the Navy because as a farm boy in Iowa, we walked on a lot of gravel roads, and I really didn't envision doing any, any time in the Army walking and marching join the Navy, see the world. Well, that changed when I got on my first ship. I quickly learned that the world is 70% water. So I did see a lot of water, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Well, just tell us about your Navy career, your training, and what ships you were on, any experiences you want to talk about. Well, after boot camp, I passed the test real well, and they sent me to Treasure Island to Electronics A School. Treasure Island is in the San Francisco Bay. And my scores indicated I should do well. Well, after four weeks of binary numbers and all of this, which I had never been exposed to, I didn't do too well on the test. So I told the master chief that was interviewing me on my failure, 
I said, I think I'd be better off in the fleet. He said, well, young man, that's just where we're going to send you. <laughs> so I had to wait for my orders, and I was assigned to the uh, aircraft carrier Ranger, which was in overhaul at Hunter's Point, which is on the south east quadrant of San Francisco. So I got put on a bus and uh, dropped off at the head of the pier with the carrier Ranger, which was a uh, fantail back end of the ship, was near the end of the pier. And I'm walking down with my sea bag on my shoulder. And there's this elevator, which I learned was an elevator later, with this great big ramp and trucks driving on and off of the ship. I had never seen anything like that in my life. And down at the end of the pier, way down there, was this Marine in full dress uniform, the quarter deck. I said, well, that must be where the crew gets on. So he let me walk all the way down the pier, sea bag on my shoulder. Sailor, this is for officers. You got to go back and walk up that ramp. Oh, my goodness. So. That was my introduction to the Mighty Aircraft Carrier Ranger. And uh, we deployed, that was in April of 62. We de deployed in November of uh, 62. We were the first carrier to take the uh, F-4 Phantom to the Western Pacific. And that was the routine for carriers based on the West Coast. Uh, the Philippines, Japan, uh, Hong Kong. And you know, my dream was to go to Australia. Well, that never happened, but we did see a lot of the Philippines, Japan, and uh, one visit into Hong Kong. You have a picture of your ship, don't you? Well, this is one I took as I was riding the Liberty launch into Hong Kong. Okay. That ship is 1,029 feet long, and while we were in port, and this is going to sound a little bit crass, but there was this vendor, Mary Sue, that had people on floats. She painted the outside of that ship, long sticks and rollers, people standing on floats. The only pay she wanted was the leftover waste food. Wow. So we sent it down to her barges, but Mary Sue painted us out. I think in three days' time, and we were in there for a five-day weekend, if I remember right. Um, you know, none of us had ever been exposed to anything like no. that. You know, Iowa farm kid, the, what little waste there was from the kitchen and the dining room was stirred up and mixed up with uh, buttermilk or skim milk and fed to the hogs. And here, the waste from our ship was no. going to food consumption for the people in Hong Kong. Now, this is a long time ago. You know, I don't think that ex exists there now. But we've had a good cruise. Um, we came back on Flag Day of 1963. And, you know, I'm part of 5,500 young people. And we flanked the perimeter of the ship for entering port in Alameda, which is across from San Francisco. And we're all standing there, slipping up to the pier. And when we got the first line over, we were dismissed. And you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of people down there on the pier. And everybody's looking over the side to see if somebody's got a welcome Alan or something. And uh, I'm standing there, <sighs> knowing full well that my folks are still farmers. My siblings are all younger than me, but hoping against hope, somebody would be holding up a sign, hi, Alan, or something like that. And, yeah. you know, it deflated me, and then, you know, reality hit me again. I'm yeah. just happy to be back. Yeah. And at this point, I'll say, you know, every time I was on a ship, and I think most of my shipmates, whenever we came back from a deployment, the conversation always was, boy, you know, once we get tied up, I'm going to run off this thing and bend over and kiss the ground of the USA. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was just very emotional just to return home. Uh, that episode, I had to accept the fact that nobody was there to <coughs> greet me. But, yeah. you know, that's life. From there, we went into the shipyards. And I think it was in, um, no, before that, we were doing some minor repair work and we were out to sea for some sea trials. 
in November of 1963. And we're setting to go into port on a Friday morning. The captain comes across on the 1MC, which is the, there's a speaker in every space, and it's the 1MC for all spaces, great communications. And we could all tell there was something very wrong, because he hesitated, usually when he had something to say, or the messages that the uh, boats in or the watch would pass were routine, knock off ship's work, meal call, chow call, you know, all this. Uh -huh. And he hesitated and paused and said, in Dallas, Texas today, hmm. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy has been shot. And I mean, we were all. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. And a few minutes later, he came back and said, we don't know what's going on, but we're not going into port today. Is there something going on in our country? You know, fear struck the whole yeah. military establishment and the civilians, I'm sure. Yeah. Once this is all settled, we'll go into port. I think we went in on Monday morning. Uh -huh. And then the following Tuesday, yeah, Monday, Tuesday, we had a memorial service. and. The forecastle is the front end of the ship where all the anchor chains are stored, and the boats and mates take great pride in polishing that up. We had a memorial service, standing room only, and believe it or not, I don't know if any other carrier had it. We had a word at organ, and we all sang the Navy hymn. Gosh. You know, that was our normal chapel service on Sunday morning. But that particular Sunday, they put the chapel service or the memorial service throughout the ship in every space because there was no way they were going to pack the entire crew into the forecastle. So that was one of the challenging and, to be honest, gut-wrenching weekends that I had when I was on the yeah. USS Ranger. Yeah, it had to be very emotional. Yes. And then we deployed. Well, that was after our deployment. But one of the things I wanted to talk about when we were coming back in the summer of 63 from our deployment, jumping backward, um, we left Yokosuka, Japan, and we were out at sea three, four days, and all of a sudden we went to general quarters. That's, you know, ready for battle. What's going on? We were informed that the Soviet bombers had overflown. You know, we were all below decks, except for the people that were up on the flight deck. We were not doing air operations, but we did have F-4s on the deck in ready alert, so we launched them. And they put the F-4 pilots in the air, and they went up and intercepted the Badgers, which was expected. You had to do due diligence. And if you remember the movie Top Gun, when they talked about how did you communicate with the uh, Soviet bomber pilots, and they said, well, we give them the international call sign for number one. <laughs> well, pilots from the USS Ranger, and I forget what fighter squadron it was, actually executed that maneuver. So when I went to see Top Gun, I said, hm, they're copycats. <laughs> and from the USS Ranger, I went to Washington, D.C. I had done time in the Air Intelligence Office on the Ranger, so I had a top secret clearance not because I needed to know anything. My job didn't require me to know anything, but I had to type the reports and all the documents. Well, in order to handle it, you had to have a top secret clearance for all the right reasons. And in the uh, fall of 64, they had a shortage of people in Washington, D.C. that had top secret clearances for administrative work. So it was real automatic that I would get orders mm -hmm. there if I would extend for nine months. But we were also facing the fact that Vietnam was heating up and the Navy at that time was the only service that could involuntarily extend people because of a crisis. So the career counselor said, Alan, if you extend, you don't have to stay on a ranger. We can get you shore duty somewhere. So that's how I landed in Washington, D.C at the Washington Navy Yard, and the name of the command was Naval Command System Support Activity. 
and their sole purpose, and this is a picture of the barracks I lived in mm -hmm. at the Washington Navy Yard and the building, uh -huh. the big red brick building there. At one time is where they made the 16-inch gun barrels for our battleships. Hmm. The top floor was filled in and offices, and it was a development center, IBM cars and computers that had the reels to develop all the software programs that they used at the basement of the Pentagon, the Naval Command mm -hmm. Network, and also for the Atlantic Fleet, Pacific Fleet, and U.S. Naval Forces Europe. Yeah. They were the Software Development Command. And here again, mm -hmm. I worked in the mail room, but because we had access to all this stuff. Yeah. When you were stationed in uh, D.C., did you get to see a lot of the town, a lot of the monuments, and a lot of the things that the, the visitors go see? Well, the first part, the, the first two and a half years in Washington, D.C., I was single sailor, and every Saturday, I would drive around the city. This was before GPS. And when I was ready to go back to the barracks, I'd look and see the Washington Monument, and with my farm boy background, I knew how to <laughs> dead reckon over toward 11th Street Southeast, the Washington Navy Yard. <laughs> Went to the uh, National Arboretum, uh, visited the White House, um, actually went on a tour through the White House back then. All you had to do was get in the queue to go. Mm -hmm. Went to the uh, lighting of the Christmas tree on the South Lawns. Yeah. Um, went to, uh, one Saturday I was on the highway that goes out toward Annapolis and all of a sudden the cars ahead of me stopped and I said, I wonder what's going on? And I was by myself that Saturday. Well, it turned out it was the uh, Navy Academy homecoming. So I thought, hey, I got a little money, I'll go and see that. I think there was a few empty seats in the stands. I got one, I don't remember the price. But the star quarterback for the U.S. Navy, Annapolis, Roger Stallback. Mm -hmm. I got to see him, and I didn't mm -hmm. know him from Adam at that yeah. time. But after the fact, I could look back and say, I got to see him yeah. when he was a quarterback. Wow at the U.S. Navy Academy. Yeah. Never went back there again, but that was one of my high points. Yeah. And then, of course, driving around the Washington area, also went out the uh, Shenandoah Valley, uh, Lou Ray Caverns, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of things that didn't require a whole lot of money, mm -hmm. because at the point I was in Washington, at the first I was a E-4, third class petty officer, administration, my base pay was $156, and I was living in a barracks, so my $156 was all spending money. 76 of it went for my car payment. <laughs> so I had to watch it, but I did enjoy it. And then one of the neat things, you know, sailors didn't know how to have fun. It wasn't all serious work. Um, Friday nights, once in a while, we'd just go for driving in the country, and uh, I think there was two, maybe three, maybe four of my buddies from the barracks. We went out Indian Head Highway, and before we left downtown Washington or Anacostia, we had bought a gallon jug of wine. I can't remember if it was Morgan David or not, but it probably was because it was reasonable. And we're driving, yeah, whatever, whatever and got to the point, we need to go back. This isn't doing us any good, and the quicker we get back, the better. And not really knowing where I was going, confession's good for the soul there, um, ended up turn, trying to turn around in an onion patch along the Indian Head Highway and promptly buried the car up to its axles, or at least it wasn't going anywhere. So everybody got out, pushed the car out, and we went back to the barracks. Thank God nobody saw us, or if they did, they let it alone. <laughs> At the end of my time in Washington, D.C., where I worked in the mailroom, I had gotten married and was ready to get out of the Navy, had a job lined up at the same command as a uh, civil servant supply procurement officer, trainee. Two days before my EAOS, expiration of obligated active service, I got cold feet. Little arrogant Allen called his detailer, which was across the river up from the Pentagon, 
if I re-enlist for six years, what can you give me? And they had my record there, even back then before you had all this computer stuff, the hard copy of my record, my evaluations were there. He said, well, Alan, if you re-enlist for six years, I can send you to London, England, staff, U.S. Naval Forces Europe, headquartered in the west end of London. Got it. I did it. Well, my division officer at the command I was at was in the first company of women in the Navy during World War II. Oh. So oh. she had 20 plus years. She was a chief warrant four. Alan, how would you like to go across to London on a commercial ship? Sounds like fun. And she knew that I had just gotten married a couple months earlier. She, that would be a great honeymoon for her. For y'all. So she said, let me call my buddy over at a bureau, because she had been in Washington, D.C. forever, hung up the phone and said, they'll modify your order, service, tr surface transportation authorized. Long story short, we went back to Minnesota, Iowa, visited our family, went to New York, had our tickets, checked our car in, Bayonne, New Jersey. I rode the subway up, no, I rode a cab because I was scared to ride the subway. We had lodging at a hotel, which is right close to the, where the SS United States was going to be leaving. And we rode at the courtesy of the U.S. taxpayers for five fun-filled days across the Atlantic on the fastest ocean liner in the world at that time, the SS United States. Gosh. And since then, we've seen a picture of it and bought it, and we got it hanging in our library in our wow. home, the SS United States. I think it's copy number six of 300 or something. That had there to be it is, a great time. Oh, heavens. And table seating, there was an Air Force enlisted man, me and our respective wives, and then this retired dry cleaning company magnet from New York City retired to Puerto Rico, and they were on their yearly Cruise, he said. You uh, military people aren't going to pay a thing. Every night we'll eat. We had the late seating, and then we'll go to the lounge. Hey, we drank our way across the Atlantic, and this gentleman and his wife picked up the tab. I mean, we were in Gosh. high heaven again. <laughs> Got to London, um, served on the staff, U.S. Naval Forces Europe. Admiral John S. McCain was the admiral, and one of the low points on his particular perspective was that's when his son got shot down over Korea. So that had an impact on the morale of the whole headquarters. Oh, yeah. But we did have interesting times there, and I'll focus on them here. Um, in April of 69, the uh, British, who were very emotionally connected to Admiral, I mean, Army General Dwight D. Eisenhower because he was the leader of the D-Day invasion and everything. By the way, his headquarters was in the same building that U.S. Naval Forces Europe mm -hmm. was, you know, mm -hmm. 7 North Audley Street in downtown London. And I think I've got a picture of it here. It is not from that time frame, but it is a picture of what wow. I found on oh. the internet. Okay. So they did a memorial service for General Eisenhower. He had mm. retired as president mm. then too, but their emphasis was the general. Mm. So they needed an honor guard to line the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral. No, we didn't wear our uniforms over there, except once a month we put them on in the lobby and the captain inspected us. We had civilian clothes authorized, business suits. Three and you got there, one new one every year. So I ended up with four or five suits after that. But we're all standing about 50 feet apart from the big red runner that goes up the steps of St. Paul's. Don't lock your knees. Everybody that was going to the memorial service walked in. And then at a given time, the command was given forward march, so the people on that side and the people on this side, all in our dress blue uniforms, marched up and we ceased within three foot of the red carpet going up. What we didn't know 
but we soon found out the royal family was going to be at this memorial service. So everybody is announced as they get out. The queen mum is marching up in her particular spot. You know, the queen, Prince Philip, Charles, you know, who's recently invested as the Prince of Wales or whatever. And to this day, I tell people that when the queen went by me, now my knees weren't locked, but I'm standing there at attention straight ahead. The queen mum winked at me. Well, now that she's passed on, I'm the only survivor. Nobody can contest that. I mean, and I've got a whole section in my little yeah. life story about the queen mum winked at Alan. And then, of course, later that year, July 20th to be exact, is when we had the moon landing. Well, mm -hmm. Naval Forces Europe didn't go to work that day. Yeah. We all were told to stay home and watch it on our TVs. Mm. And nobody that was stationed over there took a TV over. British television had different kinds of lines. You couldn't take a US TV over there. So we all assembled at the place where I lived, which was a fourplex in the other three units were lived in by two Air Force and one more Navy man. And we all had young people, toddlers. So we pulled the TV out, and this was early in the morning. So we had scrambled eggs, I remember, and uh, champagne. So as soon as they stepped mm. on the moon, we popped the cork, oh. drank some champagne, and celebrated the uh, moon landing and our English neighbor next door who was a widow lady that lived in a one-story house and this was a fourplex we were in and the English have always been big on observing special events with firecrackers she came to the fence and handed it to us here light these off I don't care what they say it ain't a holiday but it is for you so we lit off oh. all these firecrackers oh. she gave us so God. I mean that was a fun time yeah. and it sort of contrasted with the seriousness of the uh, mm. memorial service yeah. for Eisenhower mm. and I think the ride over to England and the moon landing were the fun times in England I did my wife and I had our two daughters there, um, born at the Navy Ho U.S. Air Force Hospital in South Ryslip, which isn't too far from London Heathrow Airport. But we did travel to Paris on a weekend trip provided by special services, and we had to put a little money to it. And then we took a 30-day holiday to Ro Naples, Italy, and visited a shipmate that I knew very well from my time in Washington, D.C. So. I should have done more traveling, but I was a young sailor, young father, and believe it or not, on staff duty, we did a lot of work. We didn't have duty days, but we had long work days, so didn't really have a whole lot of time to go be a tourist. However, the week before we were due to come back to the United States, I took a week's leave, and uh, my wife had a uh, part-time job with the Navy headquarters, so I took my oldest daughter and we went sightseeing. And at that point she would have been two years old, but we went to the Tower of London and all this stuff, oh, and good. I showed her all around. Good. So we rode back to the United States on Transworld Airline on Labor Day of 60, 69, yeah, something okay. like that, okay. and went to Minnesota, went to Iowa, and I had orders to the USS Sellers, a guided missile destroyer, home ported in Charleston, South Carolina. And I will get a picture of the guided missile destroyer Sellers. And when I built this book, I also just had to include a picture of what Allen looked like. Sharp looking Navy man. Break? Yes. Yeah. On camera. And my duty aboard the Sellers, which was a guided missile destroyer, was essentially the administrative officer, although an officer had the title. Uh, I did the paperwork, I did all the correspondence. I was essentially the captain's writer, uh, the ship secretary, and all the paperwork, mail call. Um, as far as the official correspondence went through the ship's office where I was the leading petty officer 
first class petty officer at the time, and I had three young people, strikers, a one-third class and two people striking to be yeoman like I did when I first went aboard the Ranger. So all my training in the Navy after I flunked out of ET school was OJT, or as it, the Navy called it, on-the-job training. Mm -hmm. You learn by osmosis, and to this day I say, the best way to learn something, do it. Yeah. So, the sellers. The high point on that ship was going to the Mediterranean. We made a six-month deployment. Um, and like when I went on the Ranger, every ship I was on had a one-year overhaul, so I only had three deployments. So my particular rate, I enjoyed a lot of family time or liberty time in the USA. Mm -hmm. But the six-month cruise to the Med, we visited Naples, um, Morocco, Tunis, and a lot of time in Naples, and three months, I mean, one whole month in Athens. Military wow. was under a quarantine, so to speak, from the U.S. government. They had, we had plenty of oil in our bunkers. We had plenty of oil in the tankers that resupplied us, but they were out of operating funds to pay for it, the administrative function. So all Navy ships were essentially, unless it was a hot spot, were told to sit in port. Hmm. We stayed in Athens for 30 days. It yeah. was wonderful oh. liberty. And yeah. Well, talk about that. Did you deal with the people at all? Get to go out well, and see a lot? Mm. Yeah, here we go. It's going to go back to this onion skin, wine in the field. Uh, the time we were there, if I remember right, was September 71, and the monastery on the outskirts of uptown Athens was having their Daphne Wine Festival. And you could go in there in the evening and pay them $2.50, or the equivalent, I should say, and they gave you this cruet. And you could go around and sample the wine, which had these little valves and cask in all these pastoral settings, and ramble through this whole beautiful, mm -hmm. luscious garden. So we interacted with the people, and a lot of people there probably, yeah, there go those sailors having a good time. <laughs> and at the same time we were there, the U.S. Saratoga, which is an aircraft carrier, would have people on liberty too. So we blended right in. They probably didn't realize that the sellers was even in port, <laughs> you know, because the, the, the sailors from the Saratoga took over the scene, and we didn't have any problem with that. And you know, I got so caught up on that, I've actually had to pull out books and read about the Acropolis. Never visited the Acropolis, but I did do a lot of time at the Daphne <laughs> Wine Festival. And at the end of the evening, you know, we'd ride the bus to this festival, and five or six of us would find a cab and say, and we knew that our ship was, we were anchored out in the harbor. The name of the pier, as far as we knew and had been told, was Failuron Delta. We'd say, Failuron Delta, and a cab driver would zing us through Athens and take us to Failuron Delta, and we'd get on our little launch and ride out and climb up the ladder to get on board. Mm. So the cruise to the Med, other than the uh, swim call and the Daphne Wine Festival, was essentially uneventful but still a lot of opportunity to see the different peoples of the world, and I'll relate more about that yeah. later. So, from the USS Sellers, we're steaming, coming back from the Mediterranean, and ships at sea get mail call. We didn't have email. My orders came, along with orders for four or five other sailors, and it was about the time for the evening meal. Well, we got our mail from a Hito that brought it over from a carrier, dumped it in a bag on a fantail, took it up to the post office. Post office was right ahead of the ship's office. The mail for the official business was sorted and given next door to me. The first orders I opened were mine. <laughs> Filled out a dream sheet before we deployed. Anything southeast, U.S., shore duty. That was my next rotation. We're home ported in Charleston. 
I had never heard of Macon, Georgia. So I hold my orders up, evening meals in progress, run through the mess decks. I got orders to Macon, Georgia. Where in tarnation is that? <laughs> Five or six sailors said, and we all knew who was expecting orders, jumped up and said, we'll take your orders. Well, tell me about Macon. Well, it's in the middle of Georgia, south of Atlanta. You'll love it. So I took my orders to Macon, Georgia. Gosh. And during the deployment where this all happened, my first wife saw fit to divorce me, and it wasn't one of these classic things where the satyr was transgressing. And she really wasn't, but she had another interest, so we won't go there. But my two daughters, uh, the last time I saw them is when they were four years old and two years old. I communicate with my grandchildren from those marriages. Mm -hmm. So, so much for that. Yeah. But then I went to Macon, Georgia, single little sailor. Well, divorced sailor, I shouldn't say single. Um, Navy headquarters on College Street overlooking downtown mm. Macon. And for anybody that's familiar with Middle Georgia, that's the federal building. It was known as the new one. Built on the former, the site of the former Wesleyan Music Conservatory, overlooking downtown Macon. So there was a lot of history in that building. But this building was built, and we had the whole top floor. And Navy Recruiting Area Three managed the recruiting efforts for the entire Southeast U.S., from the Mississippi, the Carolinas, up through Tennessee, and in later years, Kentucky. So we had a big responsibility. I didn't do any recruiting. I did paperwork and we developed a goal scheme and all that. And again, this was all before computers. So we had to manually input census data into little adding machines and figure out where the people were and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So during that time in Macon, one day I'm newly divorced, no attachments, looking at the girls but not seriously involved. The skipper, a full Navy captain, called me in the office and said, your job today, give me the keys to his uh, Crown Victoria, if they were Crown Victorias then or not. Ford, four-door sedan, white with a big Navy emblem on the side. I want you to go to Milledgeville and see where Carl Vincent lives. At that time, he had retired from the mm -hmm. U.S. House, but he was well known and well respected. And when you find out where he lives, knock on his door, introduce yourself, and say, You know, I'm here as the duty driver for Captain <clears throat> J.T. High, I believe was the, the commander, captain at that time. And, you know, I'm on a mission to find out where you live, and he'll be in touch to pay his respects with a courtesy call. Carl Vincent's sitting on the front porch, but to find his house, and again, no address, no nothing, no GPS. I stopped at the police off, department office in uniform and told him what my cover story was. I'm here to find where Carl, oh, go out there, turn right, and you get to the top of the hills, there's a great big house with a front porch. That's Carl Vincent's. Hmm. So I drove up and gave him my story. That's all right, sailor. Have a good day. And for anybody that doesn't know it, Carl Vincent was very instrumental in getting a lot of military mm -hmm. organizations in the great state of Georgia, yeah. which I now call home. Yeah. I retired there. But one Sunday afternoon, I'm watching television and the president came to town and they got this great big broadcast from Mercer University and Carl Vincent sitting on a chair there. Hmm. The name of the next aircraft carrier is the USS hmm. Carl Vincent. And that's when I knew what the purpose of that trip was. Uh -huh. Somebody had to find out where in tarnation he lived so they could <laughs> go out and pick him up. <laughs> I wasn't the duty driver that day. You can bet there was a whole lot of bars and stars yeah. along with the duty yeah. driver from Washington, oh, wow. D.C. <laughs>
But Uncle Carl was always well respected in Middle Georgia, mm -hmm. and you know he has since passed on. Yeah. But uh, we do have a great aircraft carrier named after him. <clears throat> in my time in Macon. was also highlighted by I started seeing this young lady on a blind date. We got married in October 7th, 72. Mm -hmm. I got the date right. That's yeah, good. okay. Everybody knows. Guys don't remember. I do, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, she had a child. We got married. And shortly thereafter, I had orders to the USS John Paul Jones, home ported in San Diego, hmm. California. However, the John Paul Jones was undergoing a one-year overhaul at the Long Beach Navy Shipyard. And by that time, I had advanced the Chief Petty Officer, E-7, but we went to San Pedro, California, and checked in to Navy housing, and it was a four-day waiting period because there wasn't that much Navy there. Mm -hmm. So there is the John Paul Jones okay. at sea, and you're wondering where I got all these good pictures from. They're on the World Wide Web, and that's where I copied uh. them from. <laughs> but the John Paul Jones, which is considered the founder of the first admiral in our Navy and all that, and everybody's heard of him, so I won't go into that. But we're on the John Paul Jones, and we're there during the bicentennial in Long Beach Naval Shipyard, which is where our youngest son was born, at the Navy Hospital, not too far from Disneyland. Well, by then our oldest was four years old, so. We went to Knott's Berry Farm in Disneyland, and my wife was really quite pregnant, but uh, she mm -hmm. still has good memories of it. But one year on Valentine's Day, we went to the Queen Mary, which was right adjacent mm -hmm. to the Long Beach Navy Shipyard, and we walked up the brow, and we had an elegant dinner on the Queen Mary. And it was, check my notes, prime rib for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but. The fun thing about that was the bicentennial. Our son, youngest son who was born there, was due end of June 76 or early July. So we were hoping for a 4th of July baby. Bicentennial, you know, didn't get any better than that, right? Well, the end of June, the John Paul Jones was designated as the host ship for a uh, Australian Navy destroyer built on the same footprint as back they had bought it from us. And if I remember right, it was the Hobart D-39 HMAS, Her Majesty's Australian ship. So I went over and visited my counterparts on there, the ship secretary and mm. his crew, and we invited them out to a uh, party at our house. We're in Navy housing. And it, mm. We enjoyed adult beverages and a lot of good, I think we did sliced pork that night because mm -hmm. we weren't barbecuing. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was probably my high point on the John Paul Jones other than the fact that once we got back to San Diego we bought a house because housing for chiefs even was a seven year wait so we put some savings we had into a house and uh, ended up living there for a year, but before, before we did that, well, once we got to San Diego, and I'm on the John Paul Jones, even as a chief, you had to park, seemed like a mile away, you know, pay grade and all this stuff. So I decided to buy a motorcycle. But I'm in the process of learning. I've never ridden one in my life. Operating and learning to pass the test to get on the base with the motorcycle and had this unfortunate accident where I jumped a curb, helmet on, thank goodness, and crushed my elbow, ended up in a hospital, 30 days in traction, six months limited duty, and by that time 
they needed, before that even expired, they needed somebody to do my job on the John Paul Jones. So they detached me, sent me to a medical holding company. And once I was cleared for duty, they assigned me to the USS Hall, which is the last all-gun destroyer in our United States Navy. How do you spell that? Hull, H-U-L-L. Oh, H-U-L-L. D-D-945. Okay. And a quick aside on that, it was <clears throat> the follow-on ship named in honor of D-D-350, which was sunk at sea during Typhoon Cobra back in World War II, mm. Admiral Halsey's problem. Mm. And doing some research again through the Reunion Association, as an aside here, I go to ship reunions, including the USS Hall, which was in Las Vegas in 2004, and we met survivors from the sinking of the 350 Hall. Hmm. And here another gut-wrenching experience. Some of these guys were in their mid-90s then. Of course, they're all deceased now. But <clears throat> one of the ships that helped rescue them was the USS Monterey. No big deal, right? The weapons officer on the USS Monterey was one Lieutenant Gerald R. Ford. You know, just, Gosh, I mean, geez. just associations yeah. that, you know, I didn't see these people in person, but having connections yeah. through all these details yeah. in my career sort of, yeah. Sort of gratifying, to say yeah, the least. Yeah. But uh, we deployed after our assignment to the hall, and that was my knowing that I was that was my final sea deployment. My wife was in San Diego with uh, two kids. One would be five. One would be one. So her and her Navy wife buddies became frequent visitors to. Balboa Navy, I mean, Balboa Zoo in San Diego. And back then it was free. Or they could go to Coronado Beach, <clears throat> the same place where the seals train. Mm -hmm. Of course, they didn't go to where the seals ran in on the sand, but they could lay there in the sand. Mm -hmm. So my kids had a lot of time at the zoo and at Coronado mm -hmm. Beach while I was deployed. Um, and the hall had an interesting thing. <clears throat> We had the opportunity to visit various places, but we pulled into Manila rather than Subic Bay, which is where carriers go in in the Philippines. We were pier side by a great big luxury hotel, but down the street was the U.S. Embassy. So me and my going ashore in twos again went down to the embassy because we had been told by some of our shipmates, you can get a Mongolian barbecue meal there for three and a quarter, all you can eat. And I had never experienced that. And we walked in and we paid them our 350 and they gave us this great big platter and they got what they call these kettle drums after you go through the line and pile on all your stuff. And they got brick mason's trowels and they're flipping this stuff around. What kind of sauce would you like on this? Or, you know, ginger water, whatever, whatever. I mean, I had never experienced <clears throat> that much good food for that reasonable a price in my whole life. So one of the high points there was <clears throat> the Mongolian barbecue. And of course, we came back to the U.S., San Diego, where the hall was home ported, <clears throat> put our house on the market and gave the real estate people 7% commission and sold it in three days. And the captain said, once your house closes, you're detached, and I was reassigned back to Macon, Georgia, because huh. I knew some people at the Bureau, always calling the Bureau. Yeah. They had first assigned me to the Naval Supply Corps School at Athens. Close enough. I, said, I think I can do better. So I called back to Macon and said, I used to work there, and the captain had heard stories about me. <laughs> because wherever I go, I have a storied <laughs> reputation. So he had the yeoman admin type call the bureau, and he called me back later and said, Alan, your orders are being changed. You're going back to make it, Georgia. <laughs> and the first go around was they needed you more in Athens at the Supply Corps School, but the captain in Macon said, hey, we need him more down here because he's been here before. We don't need to train him. So mm -hmm. I ended my yeah. 
21, for pay purposes, your career in Macon, Georgia, <clears throat> doing the same kind of job that I had when I was there in 71 to 75. So recapping my Navy, four different ships, four shore duties, although two of them were at the same place, Navy Recruiting Area 3, Washington Navy Yard and London, England. And, you know, I joined the Navy and it was no big deal. But when I was ready to retire, the skipper, in fact, asked me, and it was a female skipper, Captain L.E. Zert, and she's now departed, so I can use her name in positive words, said, oh, Alan, do you want a party? I said, well, I, when I joined, nobody had a party. Now, my folks and siblings may have had a party once I left. <laughs> and I, I chose 31 December 81 deliberately, because while I was on active duty, my home of record was where I paid taxes and all that. I said, once I retired, then I would be susceptible to wherever I retired. So I'll make it the last day of the year, and then as soon as the voting booths open or the election office opens in 82, I'll sign up to be a citizen here, you know, mm -hmm. get my voting card and all that, so I don't need to do a partial year tax return. Yeah. So <clears throat> my folks flew down from Iowa. You know, their oldest kid had done pretty good for 21 years, never got court-martialed, <laughs> and they came the captain was on leave, but here's a picture in black and white of my folks as I'm standing oh. at the Commodore's door on the day I retired from the Navy, and my wife and our two children and the executive officer or chief of staff read me my transfer to the Fleet Reserve orders, because after 20 years you go to the Fleet Reserve and then after 30 or 10 more, then you're on the official retired list. And I don't know if that's unique to the Navy or not. And then he reaches back on the Commodore's desk, who wasn't there, and pulls out this beautiful folder. Okay. Captain, uh, Captain, or the, com, uh, the, the, the Navy commander says, okay, Chief Teasy, stand at attention. And he opens up this big folder. The Secretary of the Navy takes pleasure in presenting the Navy Commendation Medal to Chief Yeoman Allen F. E. T. Z. United States Navy. And it goes on to say, for the following service, the citation, and expounding on my achievements at that command, for the Secretary of the Navy, T. B. Hayward, Admiral, United States Navy, Chief of Naval Operations. Well, that's in a folder, and the folder is in a big framed, matted picture frame. So what I did was copied it right there. Good. So that was my end of 21 years, or 20 years in the Navy. Um, Your family had to be so proud of you that day. Yes, in fact, I was sort of the Motivation, I think, for my two younger brothers, one of which was two years younger than me, and one which is 12 years younger. All three TZ boys served in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, there was a crossover. Mother, my mother had a sixth grade education, but she was a very effective farm wife and religious and all this. And in later years after she passed on, we'd get together and talk about our upbringing. How did our mother endure the fact that she had three sons in the Navy during the Vietnam, and we call it a war, you know, a lot sure. of people say it was a crisis. Mm -hmm. We called it yeah. a war. Yeah. And the high point I want to emphasize here, I'm laying in my rack at the Washington Navy Yard one evening, getting ready to go on liberty. And I don't think this was the same day we went out and turned around in the onion patch, but maybe five o'clock they come across in the barracks 1MC, communications. The USS Turner Joy and the USS Maddox have been torpedoed in the Tonkin Gulf. Wow! I knew my brother 
was a fire control technician on the Turner Joy. Hmm. That was for August 1964. But they quickly followed that announcement up that there was, they were torpedoed, but the torpedo went by the ship. They quickly followed it up that there was no casualties. But that was the beginning of the uh, McNamara, President Johnson, War Powers Act to get us more involved in Vietnam. So I never saw any in-country service. None of my sibling brothers did, but my brother was there, really what you could call the start of the Vietnam War with the uh, Tonkin Gulf incident. Yeah. And, you know, they come up with a patch and it's got the colors of the Tonkin, or of the Vietnamese flag. And it's called the Tonkin Gulf Yacht Club. They're <laughs> members of that. Well, he had complications with uh, lungs, not connected with Agent Orange, but he passed away in 2006 when uh -huh. he died we pinned him with his Tonkin Gulf Yacht oh, gosh. Club patch. But jumping back to August of 2004, which would have been 40 years after that date, my brother, who was a fire control technician, sitting in the director that fires the guns, or, yeah, that, that ship only had guns, that points the guns to wherever, watched the torpedo go alongside the ship. Wow. You know, so nobody could contest his relay. So he related that whole story to the local newspaper. And well, I should say the regional newspaper from Northeast Iowa. The, you know, the David L. Teasy can talk about the Tonkin Gulf 40 years after the fact. And, you know, I got clippings of all that stuff, too. So, Had he talked about it at all before then? Well, my younger brother and I, when we'd all be back in Iowa, we would take David. Guttenberg, Iowa's got a lot of limestone buildings and pubs right along the river and the basements were pubs. We'd take our brother David pub crawling. Mm -hmm. No matter how much beer we put in him, he'd look at us and say, I know you want me to talk about the Tonkin Gulf. Not going to happen. Or words to that effect. Yeah, you know. yeah. Well, it was all until it was the time frame had expired. Yeah. They couldn't really talk about okay. it. And then going back in retrospect thinking about the U.S. Navy, and any time anybody crosses the equator, you become a shellback. Hmm. I was on the Ranger, and it was in May of 64. We went out of Alameda, California, with a few airplanes on the deck, so nobody could be suspicious. It wasn't sea trials. We were going out for routine ops, so there had to be some planes on the deck of the carrier, right? Yeah. Well, a couple of days later, this U-2 comes in and lands. Nobody knew about it except the people that worked the flight deck and, of course, the people in the mm -hmm. bridge. You know, you can't miss seeing mm -hmm. it when it comes in. And we did surveillance through that U-2 after we had crossed the equator. The French were conducting some sort of nuclear test or something in some remote island in the South Pacific. and. It was the first carrier, they had specially modified this U-2. That means put a tail hook on it so they can hit the wire, yeah. land on yeah. a carrier. Gosh. Um, we were all told that we couldn't go through the hangar deck, which is what we all went through the hangar deck to get to the mess decks or chow hall. Find some other way, and there were other ways. The quickest way was to go through the hangar deck. You ain't going to go through the hangar deck. You're not going to get close to this U-2. Mm. Fact of the matter is, one day I opened the hatch and looked out, and you know, there's all these Marines, because every carrier back then had 80 Marines on board. They were watching that nobody would get to see yeah. the U 2 up close. You know, if you were on the flight deck crew, you were obviously going to see it, but we were all told you will not talk about this. And again, that Gosh. was in 64. Yeah. That's, inter that's so, very interesting. So at a reunion in 2004, we talked about it. Good, good. <laughs> it was declassified <laughs> by then. And I missed that when I was talking about my time in the yeah. Ranger. So though I had a lot of good high adventure. And to sort of recap all my comments here today, I've sort of made some notes. I made three deployments, three different ships, one aircraft carrier, guided missile destroyer to the Mediterranean, 
one all-gun destroyer to the Western Pacific, and after each deployment, and I may have mentioned this earlier, we enjoyed the opportunity to see the world, but every time we came back, mm -hmm. and I don't recall ever doing this, but we always said, you know, once we hit the pier, we're going to bend over, <laughs> when we hit the pier or the ground, we're going to bend over and kiss the USA. Yeah. And, it, I, and I mean, I was in the Navy back when we didn't have civilian clothes aboard ship, so when we left the ship, we were standing tall in our uniform of the day, which was either dress whites mm -hmm. or full dress blues. Made you appreciate the U.S., didn't oh, it? Oh, yes, and we were always happy and we were to return, and we were always happy and proud to be associated with the U.S. Navy. Now, in appreciation for everything, all of us had the opportunity to serve peoples of many ports we visited, and in my case, some shore duty in London, we saw people at every economic level, and we learned to appreciate the history of all the peoples in the world. Um, when I was on the cellars, we pulled into Tunis and Morocco, and those people there, we were told, the U.S. Embassy sent a message to the ship. If your people transgress and have any connections with anybody pushing illicit drugs, marijuana, mm -hmm. in that time frame, and they're apprehended, you won't see them again. Mm. If you do, the, their laws then, where the offending part of their body, where we see them with this, will be cut off. Like, you know, your hands or fingers. I put the fear of God in all of us. Yeah. None of us had a problem. No. We all came back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that had a major impact on us. And every port we went into, the U.S. Embassy or liaison, Navy liaison, would always send messages to the ship to give us the peculiarities of what you should or shouldn't do to bring disrespect on, one, our country, two, on our Navy, mm -hmm. or three, even yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I don't know if they still do that, and I'm sure they do, because yeah. we represent, and that was laid on us heavily every time we went into port. Oh, that's good. Did you ever have any issues uh, during the 60s when there were protesters and others that were upset about us being in Vietnam? Did you ever get any harassment or any conduct that you would not approve of from them to you? Question, yes. Uh, the high point of Vietnam in the late 60s, well, 66, 67, 68, when they were protesting around the world, mm -hmm. I was in that six or seven story building, U.S. Naval Forces Europe. On Sunday afternoons is when they did the protest mm -hmm. because most everybody had to work. Mm -hmm. The protest would be in Grosvenor Square, which was on the south side of our headquarters, and also on the uh, east side of the U.S. Embassy in London West One, the fashionable area of London. And protesters would assemble there mm -hmm. and do their thing. and. You know, Molotov cocktails, you know, were a fact of life. So we had to go into the Navy headquarters and be inside the offices by the windows that were facing Grosvenor Square oh, in case a firebomb was thrown at us. Yeah. Uh, I don't think any of them ever were thrown at, but they did have yeah. the opportunity or the potential to do it. So that was my exposure to the people protesting. Okay. And of course, I heard about, because yeah. when we were stationed in London, we had access to all the best mm -hmm. communications at that time in the world, mm -hmm. including Walter Annenberg was the ambassador to the mm -hmm. United Kingdom or the Court of St. James. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, London's five hours earlier than the U.S. Yeah. We could go over to the Embassy Theater on Monday noon and watch the highlights of the NFL football games. Uh, yeah. uh. They weren't transmitted on the internet. Yeah. They were tapes. Yeah. 
That's interesting. I mean, that's the kind of, yeah. London was the interesting thing. Yeah. Um, and going back to observing cultures and peoples and developing respect, I've got to be honest here. I was born and raised in Northeast Iowa. We were white. The company I was in the Navy with was all white. The one kid from Alaska was white. He was our training PO. He, he tutored us. He took notes. But the first time I saw a black citizen was when I was in the Navy. In the same battalion I was in, we also had a company of young people from the Philippines, which had been recruited in the Philippines and flown over here to serve as stewards or assistants to officers. You know, the wardroom meals, cleaning the officers' mm -hmm. staterooms and that. I mean, we got to observe and we all went through the same training, you know, the manual coat of arms, all the marching, all the education and learning. We didn't look down at anybody because, to be truthful, we were all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. We enlisted to avoid the army or whatever, whatever. And, you know, if you screwed up and were set back, that means you had to do, endure an extra week of training. That was a pretty good motivator. Yeah. Hey, I'll do the best I bloody can. And, you know, you didn't look down at anybody. Mm -hmm. We all were in the same quote or pardon the expression, we were all in the same boat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. We, we yeah. wanted to exceed because, or exceed, because we sure didn't want to get set back and go through another yeah. week of this crap. <laughs> and back then, we considered it. And reflection, boot camp taught us teamwork and how to function as an integral part of a larger unit. Mm. And part of that is to respect everybody's job mm. and respect everybody as a person. So I never really had any difficulty with that. That was a great life lesson you learned in the military. Yeah, and they, they drummed it in our little heads by experience. You know, you mm -hmm. screw up, you ain't gonna, yeah. you ain't gonna get out early. You're gonna get yeah. sent back, and you're yeah. gonna have to put up with this crap one more week or yeah. whatever. <laughs> and I don't think we had anybody in our company set back. Good. Is there anything you'd like to talk about concerning your experience after the military? Well, I'll, I'll preface that with my first duty station was the Ranger. That was the most informative experience for this little, what I say, tender farm boy, even mm -hmm. though I was 21. I had never been really out of it. And here I was traveling all over the Western Pacific, seeing a lot of people, meeting a lot of people, and reflecting back on the Filipinos and blacks. And anyway, the Ranger had every culture on board. No. We all got along. What choice did we have when yeah. you're out in the middle of the ocean? Yeah. You know, if you don't... Um, I think that sort of set me up for the follow-on. The most educational and fun was the Ranger. The most enjoyable opportunity was London, England. I mean, that was living high on a hog. Challenging yet rewarding. And to answer your question now that I beat around the bush, I did 21 years in the Navy for pay purposes as a office clerk typist, office manager, all those good things. Come time to retire, who in middle Georgia wanted to hire a 42-year-old male secretary? Mm -hmm. And I was sweating it. Our oldest kid was seven, our youngest was three or whatever. And my Navy retirement wasn't going to cover all the expenses. And our kids were young enough that I didn't, really didn't think that my wife working would generate enough income because if you paid for daycare or whatever, you know, it'd be a, even worse. I saw an ad in the paper for a, uh, even before I retired or transferred to the Fleet Reserve, office manager for a nursing home dial the number, and I'm at my desk at Navy Recruiting Area 3. Well, you got a few minutes? I'd like to interview you. 
So I drove five miles to the east side of Macon and went in. First response, I had mailed out resumes and all this, never anything other than I'm too qualified to be a male secretary. I know what that meant. <laughs> Sat down on the sofa and this desk and you know the administrator of the nursing home looking down at me. Turned out he was a short guy. <laughs> we talked for about an hour and you know, he general questions. And after about an hour he says, you know, you're probably sweating bullets about what you're gonna do once your retirement is official at the end of December because I had made that clear. I'm a retired Navy hospital corpsman. I administer this nursing home. When you called me and said who you were, I had you hired because I knew what a yeoman can do. Wow. Oh, wow. I mean, I breathed a sigh of relief. Yeah. I mean, wow. wow. I worked there for a year and a half. I started at $5 an hour. And back then, I was the third highest paid person at this nursing home. Gosh. The administrator and the director of nurses and then there was Alan at five. And after a year, I got up to 550. And in the meantime, I had applied for a job at Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company, which had built a new factory in middle Georgia, owned by British U.S. Tobacco, headquartered in London. <laughs> I got out there in May, 83. So I did a year and a half at the nursing home. Loved the job went out there and when I walked in the door as a trainee, which I had to be trained, took six months, my pay jumped to 10 bucks an hour. Mm. Now I'm in high cotton again, right? Mm -hmm. Went through training, certified, six months of training and they did their on-site training with the machinery. Learned how to operate a machine that could pack three, 256 packs a minute, a mere 17 years later in 1999 when I retired at the age of 58 and a half because we were on concrete floors with parquet and 12 hour days five or four days a week depending how the rotation went my legs were starting to hurt I need to so I at that age I had my Navy retirement I could walk out the door at Brown and Williamson with a retirement and I was only three years away of getting Social Security early. Mm -hmm. So I walked out of there on 1 September, Labor Day, 1999. Had a big party <laughs> at our house. My brother flew down for that. And we went out to the base and loaded up with all kinds of adult beverages. <laughs> went to Kroger and my pre-ordered on Wednesday uh, 12 platters, uh, shrimp platters, and a bunch of brats. <laughs> backed up my pickup into the driveway. We had put 15 cases of good beverages, including Corona <laughs> and Bud, in the bed of the pickup and 500 pounds of shaved ice. My brother was grilling brats on the grill and my wife was taking a two, two mile trip up to the local Kroger when the shrimp platters were getting low. You know, 140 shrimp. We had 250 people all the people in our subdivision, all the people that were off duty at Brown and Williamson and all the people at our church in the period of five hours at my retirement party. So I did a successful follow-on career not related to administration except for my year and a half at Oak Valley Nursing Home in Macon. Mm -hmm. And when I went to my job interview at the tobacco factory, the young man behind the big desk, you've done administration for all these years. What makes you think you can work in a factory environment and work machinery? Sir, I was a farm kid for 21 years. Verse six don't count, but I didn't tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on a farm, did casual labor for farmers. I know how to take orders because of my military training. And I operated all kinds of farm machinery, hammer mills, uh, silo fillers and blowers, and you know, did light maintenance work on farm equipment. I believe I'm qualified. He said, get out of here, go down the hall and get your physical. <laughs> I made it, a sigh of relief. And I retired there, so now I'm on Social Security. 
and I retired from Brown and Williamson when they were working 13 days a week, 12 hour days. <laughs> so my quarters for Social Security are tremendous. Yeah. And you know, people say CPI is pretty good. My first full year in the Navy, I still got that little mm -hmm. IBM card, $1,120. <laughs> my first paycheck as a Navy retiree was 760 Without going into details, my monthly retirement check from the Department of Defense far exceeds yeah. double that amount. So my after life from the military, I've been well blessed. And the only way I could be a failure now, I'm retired, is if I totally mismanage my resources. And again, I was always at the right place at the right time. And I will acknowledge, you know, the kid that flunked out of school, college, turned out pretty good. I think that's why my folks were happy to come down and see yeah. me when I retired from the Navy. It was challenging. Were there family separations? Yes. Was that always easy? No. But my deployment on the hull, we were stationed in San Diego. I think every other day I wrote a letter, and my wife still has them in sequential order in the nightstand. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the military back then, no emails, remember? Letter one, the next letter you wrote, you wrote number two on it. So if the mail, depending how it left the ship, got crisscrossed, you always read the letters in sequence that they were written by the writer, otherwise it might be a convoluted misunderstanding. But well, I enjoyed you've... it and come to appreciate, and I just got done saying how well blessed, my parents, my Navy background, and uh, The opportunities I had at Brown and Williamson, I'll sum up. I, I started there in 83. When I left in 99, technology, not that I'm a technological genius, but our training, we were running machines that were producing 700 packs of cigarettes a minute. A minute. That's a minute, wow. considering 256, 17 years oh, earlier. Gee. I've lived through some challenging times. I've lived through some exciting times. Just like anybody that was born in the early 1900s or even the mid 1900s, and they're still alive today. Whew. Yeah. You know, what else can you say? Well, all the good things that have happened to you, you cer certainly earned with your hard work, and diligence, and your and your personality. The kind of guy you are. So. Well, thank you. Sue, you have any questions? I think I'm good. I think I'm okay. Is there anything else you'd like oh. to? Sure. Oh, your hats, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are we live again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Since my retirement from the Navy in 81, I've become a member of every ship I served on reunion associations. Some ships have reunions every year, some every two years, some every 18 months. But when we go to those reunions, we wear with pride. This is my first ship, the Mighty Ranger, attack aircraft carrier, top gun of the Pacific Fleet. My second ship was the guided missile destroyer out of Charleston, the USS Sellers. And then the namesake of our great Navy, and John Paul Jones is buried in a crypt at the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm young Scottish guy. Well, he did grow up, yeah. And my final <laughs> ship, the last all-gun destroyer in our Navy, the USS Hull. Hmm. Well, I, I can't tell you how much, number one, we appreciate you coming in, and number two, how fascinating your life has been. I mean, you've you learned hard work, I'm sure, on that farm. and. and you said you had all that work before you even started school each day. So you grew up in a family that taught you a work ethic, and then your attitude towards people from a racial standpoint and just everybody being equal and pull as a team. You learned that in the military. And every one of your assignments, it sounds like in one way or another, regardless of what your rank was, you were in some leadership position even driving out to the onion fields. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you, people gravitated to you, I can tell. 
just because of the kind of guy you are. And well, for that incident, I was the only one in the barracks in our little group that had a car. Well, that helped. <laughs> that, that helped. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're obviously a good family man. You're a hard worker. You're a patriot. And I think both Sue and I are just sort of fascinated with your life. And another thing I need to point out is how well educated you are. I bet you have dealt with people in more countries than probably 90% of the people in our country. Okay. And as you know, traveling to other places broadens your horizons and your understandings and yeah. and, yeah, <laughs> and your appreciation yeah. for this country. So I just want to tell you how much we appreciate you coming in here, how impressed we are with the way you've lived your life and what you've done. and. Uh, of course, thank you for your service. You're welcome. Thank you for your service. And I just thank remembered you. we have one uh, more photograph that we didn't get. Did we get the oh. swim call? Well, when I was talking about the swim call in the middle of the Mediterranean from the USS Sellers, that's what I looked like. I even had a beard then. Wow. <laughs> that, that's pretty impressive. I can still fit into that swimsuit. It's a Catalina. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. All right.